Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about all things board game related. Today we have a review for Pulsar 2849. This is from Vladimir Suchi and Czech Games Edition. This is a dice drafting game that we've played and played and played and are finally getting it to the review. Yeah, this is very long overdue. We've had it for probably two months now. Yeah. And actually hit uh, a number of our top ten lists of the year. I Everyone who played this game loves this game. Yeah. It is a little overwhelming at first because there are so many options in the game. <laughs> yeah. But as David said, it's a dice drafting game. You're using dice in order to empower yourself to use a number of different actions within the game. Yeah, it shares a lot in common with some classic heroes, kind of like Castles of Burgundy, where there's so many options, but you just have two dice basically during any turn, and you use those dice to do one of a crazy amount of things. Yep, so let's talk about the components first. We're not gonna go heavy into the actual gameplay mechanics, because uh, there's a number of reviews out there. We're gonna give yeah. you more of our idea and our, our thoughts behind the game. So let's talk about the components first. In the middle of the board, you're gonna have a giant star system. It's a round board. And the reason why it's round is because you have all these different modules that go onto the side. And they can be positioned in any way that you so wish. So if you have different table configurations, it's pretty nice because you can put these in any kind of configuration it, that you so wish. It really is, and I've had to do that a number of times. We've played this on a few different size tables. Round tables are beautiful for this game. Sure. But uh, like Jeremy said, these things can be kind of rotated around. They could even be stacked yeah. to some degree, depending on what your table looks like and how many people you're playing So their with. position does not matter. However, on the actual star system itself, you have a number of these double-sided planets. On the back side, you're going to show like a, a star. Yeah. And on the other side, it can show lifeless planets or inhabitable planets for you to go to, and there's a bonus across the bottom. However, these are going to be put randomly in all these different star systems, so you don't know how they're placed at the start of the game. Yeah, in the game box, there's one more than you'll need, so one will be left out of the game. But like Jeremy said, these are face down. Part of the game is exploring all these things, uncovering them, and sort of ex uh, spreading out your tokens across the entire board. Everyone's kind of have a starship that's placed in a specific location according to turn order. And then you're going to see a, a variety of different nodes. These are flight paths for your starships to move around. And then you have pulsars. This is kind of the name of the game. You're right. trying to uh, place your pulsar rings around these and then put gyrodynes in them in order to score points round after round. And in the middle of the board, you're going to see a red die. That's a bonus die that each player is allowed to use once on their turn if they have the ability in order to gain that dice. Yeah, there's a number of ways of getting that. But like Jeremy said, it is a bonus die. It's in addition to the two normal die that you'll have. And there's a few different ways you can grab that. There's a point scoring track around the outside, and then around the outside of that, you're going to have all the different modules that you, we spoke of. On this side, you're going to see where all the dice are allocated. Depending upon the number of players is how many of these silver dice you're going to use. In a four-player game, it says right here on the board you're going to use nine dice. You're going to roll these dice and put them into the locations that they are allocated. Now across the top, you're going to see two different tracks. This is a very combative game when it comes to positioning yeah. yourself on these tracks. One of the tracks determines your uh, turn order within the game, and the other one determines how many influence cubes you could possibly gain our engineering cubes you could gain at the end of the round. Around here, you're going to see a number of other different modules. Over here, you're going to have gyrodynes. Uh, they require a specific number of dice, not only to acquire them, but also to use them. Yeah, what's nice about this game is everywhere on the board, there's a lot of information, yeah. but it's all useful information. Anywhere where you see basically a die, you know that on your turn, you're going to be able to use that die to do that action. For instance, mm -hmm. Jeremy mentioned these gyrodynes. There's die below each of these. A one will get you one of these, a two will get you one of these, but then on the gyrodynes themselves, there's another little die. So once you have them on the board, you'll be able to activate or flip those with that die. Right. Right above those are scoring markers for acquiring two of one of those specific type of ones. So it's kind of a race in order to gather those on your side of the board. You have a tech tree over here. Now this is a, an incredible amount of variety within the game. There are a number of different tech trees and they're all double-sided. Yeah. So you can, you can play with the base configuration within the game or you can randomly set it up however you so wish. Right, in fact, there's a lot of components in this game that are double-sided. The tech tree is one of them. This is gonna be something where you're going to, on your turn again, use your die to choose one of the techs that are available. This also sort of doubles as the round marker. Mm -hmm. So this first ring is gonna be the first round and so on and so forth all the way up until the eighth round. Meaning that you can't learn some of those techs until you get later into the game. Uh, over here, you're gonna have a place to either place uh, dice in order to gain uh, modifiers. Yeah, you the have... modifiers are 
kind of like the workers from Castles of Burgundy or a lot of other games you've played. One of them's going to get you a plus one or minus one to a die that you use. One of them's going to get you just a plus two. Yeah. And you uh, must be noted, you can only use one of these tiles to manipulate the dice. Right above those, we have set up the end game goals. There's a variety of different end game goals. These two are double sided. <laughs> There's a whole variety of these. You only play with three of them. And everyone's kind of racing in order to gain these by the time the eighth round ends. And then you have the option of playing with a personal headquarters. Again, this is double sided. So you have a number of things that you personally can do or abilities that you can acquire through the course of the game. It works like a pyramid structure, so you're going to have to have two bases in order to build the ones above you. So how does the game actually work? Well, let's talk about it. At the start of the game, you're going to randomly configure the turn order, and then in reverse turn order, each player is going to place their starship on one of these specific locations. It doesn't really matter where you place uh, at the start, because uh, it's, it's completely random at the beginning. Yeah, not too much. I think after a few plays, you start to get the idea that you might want to take a peek at whatever the tech tree looks like, maybe your own personal headquarters, because there are some abilities here, and we will definitely not go through all of these, yeah. but some of them will key off of certain colored paths yep. and things like that, so you that might take a, a role in your placement. And then you're going to place every player's marker in the center, dead center of each of the two tracks, and then the first player is going to roll the dice. Whatever their configuration is, now these are just six-sided dice, and they're going to place them in the locations that are rolled. The next thing that is going to happen is since there's nine dice, you're going to figure out the place or the median yeah. of those dice. Yeah, the median dice, if you haven't, uh, if you've forgotten all of your <laughs> elementary school math, the median is the middle die. Yeah. So you're going to find where the middle die is. You're actually going to cover up that entire space. So there might be two or three or more die in that same space. Mm -hmm. You'll cover that up, and then you're going to count how many die are to the right of it, how many die are to the left of it, and then move this marker from the median location one space to the left or right. Now it is possible that it won't move at all if there's equal numbers of die on each side. If you guys are confused, confused by the median, it's five. <laughs> so you're going to go five spaces to the left or five spaces to the right. That's your middle die. Uh, once you configure this uh, marker, then you get to start the round. This is where the drafting happens. Now in a four-player game and a three-player game, you're going to do a snake draft. And basically yeah. how that works is starting with the first player, he's allowed to pick any one die that he so wishes. He's going to collect that to his side, and you're going to go around, and then you're going to snake back in the other way. So every single round, each player is going to get two dice, and one of them is going to be left on the board. Yeah, and the one that's left on the board while we're talking about it is also going to relate to this bonus die if you, you, if you pick this up using engineering cubes. It's going to take that value. Now... The crux here is that your higher value die, dies are almost always better because they yeah. empower you to do more things. They allow you to move more across the board. They're going to give you better abilities with technologies that you may build. However, your lower sided dice cause less of a penalty for you. And this is how it works. When you take a die, again, you can take any die that you so wish. You take that and you place it on your side. And then you're going to count the number of squares to the left or to the right of that die that you just took. In this case, I took two spaces over. So I would take one of my markers and move it two spaces to the right. If I took a lower die, that lets me move to the left. That's important because at the end of the round, that's going to determine the player that could be first player and also the people that could get engineering cubes because you want to be further to the left. However, remember, when you take those smaller dice, you're not getting as many benefits. Exactly. It's a nice give and take here because there are actually places on the board and things you can do in the game that benefit from having a one or a two. Mm -hmm. uh, but like Jeremy said, the larger dice are usually more valuable, particularly when it comes to moving around the board. Yep. But as he said, if you go to the left, it's generally good. If you go to the right on those tracks, it's generally bad. And when you take one of those dice, you're allowed to move any one of those two markers. It doesn't have to be the top marker or the bottom marker. You can move the top marker twice, the bottom marker twice, or right. one in either direction. Again, according to how many spaces away from this yellow marker that you drafted. Once everyone is done drafting, you then have the action phase. This is when the players are going to, in turn order, use all of their dice. So the first player is going to use their two dice. And then the second player is going to use their dice and so forth until the round ends. Now, as we said, there are so many different <laughs> options on using your dice. There's a variety of different things that you can do, from moving your spaceship around the board, to taking tiles, to taking gyrodynes, to getting tech. A lot of options. Yeah, just to cover off a few of the things that you do sort of in the core mechanics of the game, is you're going to be moving around the board. And that's the first thing you can do is simply 
use a die mm -hmm. and move that number of spaces. You're going to take your ship and move from node to node, noting that you can't cross the same path twice. You can right. hit the same node more than once, but you cannot cross the same path. You're doing this to move to the star systems, to move to the pulsars. When you hit a star system and land on it, you're going to flip it. That's going to get you this bonus at the bottom if you can place one of your tokens on a blue planet. That is, if there is a blue planet. Right. If you pass through one, you're still flipping that. You're still putting one of your tokens out on the board, but you have to put it on one of the uninhabitable the planets. The lifeless planets there. Yep. The other thing you're going to land on is the pulsar. This is where the game gets its name. When you land and finish your turn on a pulsar, you'll immediately take one of your claim rings. You'll put it around that pulsar. Now, that's going to be where you put your gyrodynes. If you have any gyrodynes, you can go ahead and put it in there as a free action. That is not something you have to use a die for. Right, and you can collect those gyrodynes before placing pulsars on the board. So you can collect several of them knowing that in the future you're going to have pulsar rings that you can place them in. Exactly. The next thing you could do is take a transmitter tile. This is something we haven't talked about yet, <laughs> but it's yet another <laughs> tile that's on this board. As you see across the top here, we have the stack of transmitter tiles. Every round is going to get three of these. You can think of these as satellites that are sort of out away from your headquarters, and you're going to be taking these tiles with dice. Some of them require one, some of them require two. When you use a die to take one, you're going to take the tile, you place it in front of you. It's going to have a couple different things on it. Right. When you look at these, they, they could have, as David said, one, two, even three different markers on it requiring that specific die. To claim one, you can use any one of those dice, and you simply place this tile face up on your side of the board, marking it with the die that you use to claim it. Through the course of future rounds, even that round, you're allowed to place more or use more die that you had drafted in order to build this transmitter out in space. Once you do, you get bonuses for that transmitter that you built. Now, the cool thing here is the more transmitters you build, you will flip them over. And you're going to see that the black outside edge is now filled with red. Whenever you connect two transmitters, you're going to add that value and then get to use the bonus die, which is going to give you basically a third action for that round. Yeah, and we can't stress enough how important it is to actually get more dice in your turns here. And there's only yeah. a few ways of doing it. That's one of them. You can spend engineering cubes to do it another way. Uh, there are some other spaces on the tech tree that might give you a bonus die or even two. So milking each turn for as many actions as you can possibly take is a good idea. Yeah, I mean, when you think about this mathematically, if you have eight rounds and you're drafting two dice every round, you're getting 16 turns. If you can get another eight turns by getting that red die Absolutely. every single round, that's 24, that's 24 actions, that's, that's a huge benefit. So, uh, Some other things that you can do is you can patent technologies. Now, as we said, there's a variety of different technologies <laughs> up here. It's depending upon the round that you're playing in is the row that you can patent those technologies. And you're basically using a die to place one of your markers in the location of the die that you used. These will give you ongoing benefits for the rest of the game. And as the rounds progress through the course of the game, they're going to give you or unlock new, possibly better abilities for you to gain. Yeah, and it's really cool. Like Jeremy said, we can't go into all the details. These just allow you to break a lot of the rules or mm -hmm. maybe even score some end game points that no one else is going to score depending on how you've played your game. But these and are, and a lot of things are actually tied into the goal tiles. Yeah. A lot of times a goal tile might come up that says you need to have five patented technologies by the end of the game. If it doesn't come out, some people may not <laughs> patent any technologies. Yeah. This game has so many options that we've played several games. I played one game where not one person took one of the transmitter tiles. So yeah. there's a lot of different things you can do. And once all the players are done using all of their dice, all two of their dice, or even any of the bonus dice that they have, they then go through a nine-step production <laughs> phase. It's kind of the cleanup phase. It sounds long, there's nine steps, but it's, it's really, really simple. Right. You're going to redetermine the turn order depending upon where players are on this track. You're going to hand out some engineering cubes, which are these white cubes over here. Players can turn those in, basically, in sets of four to be able to gain a bonus die as well, which is really, really flexible for people. Plus, they can possibly feed in some in-game points if you have a lot of those at the end of the game. Yeah, exactly. And another thing you're going to do, or the next thing you're going to do during this phase, is you're going to take a look down here at the end of these tracks. Like we said earlier, the right side is bad. The far right side is very bad because you're going to get negative points every round if you're down there, either negative one or negative two points. And that will happen if you're drafting some of the fours, fives, and sixes yeah. uh, through the rounds. Then you're going to score points for the gyrodynes that you have on the board. Now, these uh, gyrodynes are going to score you points depending upon 
the values that are on the back sides of them if you flip them over. Plus, they can also give you additional uh, bonuses depending upon what round it may be. Right, and flipping these gyrodynes and getting them active takes a little bit of doing. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to claim a pulsar, you're going to have to acquire a gyrodyne, you'll place it out there, then you'll have to effectively activate that gyrodyne. So there's a there's a few steps involved in there, but as soon as you can get gyrodynes going in two round two, mm -hmm. maybe three, those are going to be points yeah. for the rest of the game. Yeah, there's another a couple other ways you can score points at the end of the round. Transmitters, depending upon which one you've built through the course of the game, can score you reoccurring points every round. And some of the technology tree right. uh, things can also score you points round after round, depending upon what time that you build them into the game. Uh, and that's basically it. You're going to move the uh, time marker up, and you're going to keep doing that for eight rounds. Now. That's basically the structure of the game. We didn't go into a lot of the the small details no. of the minutia of the game. However, let's talk about our review because, like you said, we've, we've had this game for two months and it hit a lot of our top 10 reasons. And it's kind of important for us to tell you guys why it's such an important game to us. Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned it already. This thing, and it took me a while to make this connection, Castles of Burgundy is one of my favorite games. And the reason is the simplicity of how you play that game. You have two dice to use on your turn but you can use those die to do an infinite, well, it feels like mm -hmm. infinite amount of things. This might beat that in that respect mm -hmm. because the decision making here, you'll get that die and you'll think, okay, I wanna do that. Or you might be waiting for your turn and think, okay, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. And then it comes around to you and you've sidetracked yourself and seen some other thing you wanna do. Yeah. And it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Some people might feel like, oh, wow, that's too overwhelming. Jeremy and I both love that sort of thing. Yep. We love decision making. We love a lot of juicy decisions to be made each turn. And this game definitely has that. It's probably the main reason I'm loving this thing. I'm going to start off with the bad first. And the, the only complaint I have about this game, other than it could be overwhelming to players who are playing it for the first couple times, is the fact that the artwork and the graphic design is a little bland. Yep. That's been noted throughout the internet. A lot of people have already said that when they've done their reviews of it. And we would, poss we would really agree with that sentiment. However, it does not spoil your enjoyment of the game itself. No, not at all. In fact, it, it can say a lot for a game when it doesn't push all the right buttons for us from a graphic design standpoint, but we still love it as much as we do because this game falls right into that same category in the same way for me that Terraforming Mars did for sure. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off what he said about his love of uh, these st style of games. This is basically a Euro point salad game yeah. with dice drafting. We both love dice drafting games. We love options. We love variability. Speaking of variability in this game, there is so much variability. There's a n number of tech trees, double-sided, ones that you're not even seeing on the board, goals that you can complete to the end of the game that are double-sided. There's more of these. Each of these headquarters are double-sided. All these planets and the way that they come out are completely variable. different from what, you know, they're, they're variable. All these transmitters, there's a huge stack of transmitters that you can go through. There's so much variety within this game. Not to mention the board itself is yeah. double-sided. Yeah. The other side of the other side of the board is actually kind of an advanced game. There's some dead ends, so it's going to make moving a little bit more tricky. Uh, it makes that whole concept of spreading these tokens all across the board quite a bit more of a task. And with that variability, you also have multiple paths to victory. A lot of these games, when you play them, there's there's one specific route that you can take. There are so many different routes in this game to score points. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't tear you down one specific route in order to do that. Uh, also, I think it's the perfect game length. A lot of people have said when we played this game, eight rounds doesn't feel long enough. It doesn't. And I love that. To me, I love games that kind of handcuff you in and say, this, this is the number of rounds. You can't do everything. You have to make a very specific path, and you have to make decisions in order to do that. And by the end of the game, especially in a three- and four-player game, you're not going to be able to do everything that you want to do. With that said, you're still going to score ridiculous amounts of points in this game. Yeah, which just feels great. And that feels fantastic. There's yeah. a lot of games. Some of our favorite games, actually, from the last few months have that same sort of a uh, good constricting feel, mm -hmm. but also at the end, you're scoring between one and 40, you know, teens and 40 points, maybe even zero points. Yeah. Um, this one feels tough to make these decisions, but in the first couple rounds, people aren't scoring any points. Yeah. And then they might score a few points. And then in the final ro round, 
I'm going all the way around the board with some of the things that I've put in place from the engine that I've built. Yeah, speaking of that, I, I, most people when they first play this game are going to concentrate heavily on the tech trees and the different things they can do on this board. Once you start playing the game, you, you realize that on the backside of this awesome player aid, you can score points from inhabiting all these planets. Yeah. And you can score a lot of points from doing that, plus get bonuses for doing it. So players, as I said, there's multiple paths to victory. There's multiple ways to approach the game. And depending upon even your starting initial headquarters, how you want to approach that game. Yeah, I would say, the last thing I would say is if you found yourself liking games in the past where you're playing your own game and you look at another player and they're doing something completely different from you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait a minute, what are you doing over there scoring those points in a good way? Yeah. You will love Pulsar 2849. And I'll say one more thing too. The the track up here, it's a fight. I love the fact that when you when you draft these dice, it's not just about the best dice for you. It's also about the best dice that gets you in position to be the first player on future turns because first player turn order is so important in this game to be able to do things and act uh, before other players because a lot of these tech um, abilities are locked out. There's only a certain number of positions that players can grab and once they're gone, they're gone. The same thing with these transmitters. Once they're gone, they're gone. So it really forces you to think about what you're drafting. Yeah, every absolutely. Single round. Every decision has an equal and opposite re you mm -hmm. know, reaction in this because if you've made your points this way, it generally means you've lost some points in another avenue. So that is Pulsar, guys. Sorry the review's been so long coming. <laughs> we obviously love the game. This is a Man vs. Meeple approved game. If you guys have any questions, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and everything else that we do, and we'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye. Season 2 of Man vs. Meeple is sponsored in part by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.